Pseudopod is extruded into this universe from a dimension of purest fear. It's beautiful in its own alien way, but what's to come will unsettle you. Pseudopod, episode 636, February 22nd, 2019. This week's story, Hagride, by Eden Royce. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's story comes to us from Eden Royce. It was originally published in Steamy Screams from Bloodbound Books in 2011, then in Eden's self-published collection, Spooklights, Southern Gothic Horror. Your narrator this week is Amy Kelly. So without further ado, let's hear a true story. Hagride by Eden Royce Narrated by Rashida Prelo Frida stood in the kitchen's dull light with a chopping knife clutched in one hand. The dinner on the table lay untouched, ice cold, and bathing in congealing fat. Her cinnamon coloring disguised the angry flare of heat in her cheeks. Still, she knew yelling wouldn't get her husband's attention so she forced a calm tone in her voice. Why aren't you staying for dinner? I made your favorite. Now I done told you I gotta go out. Henry came out of their bedroom, buttoning up his good shirt and tucking it into the slack she'd taken her time to iron that morning. Out where? You can't stop to eat dinner with your wife before you go. Give me some of your time. Thought I'd just gave you some. Henry laughed, his tongue grotesquely pink against his smooth ebony face. He waggled his long, limp penis at her before tucking it back into his pants. Could you put that away? I was gonna lop it off. You weren't gonna do that to this valuable piece of merchandise. I wanted to spend some time with you. Just us. Like we used to. Tears threatened to fall from her maple syrup-colored eyes. A man needs some time to himself, baby. I told you that long time ago. I know, but... He took a pick from his back pocket, a metal one with a balled-up fist for a handle, and ran it through his short, tight afro. In the hall mirror, he patted it with both palms to even out the dew. He never said where you were going? Going out with the fellas. Relax. Get a couple drinks. You look mighty nice for a night out with Butch and them. She put the knife down and wiped her hands on her apron. You promise me. No more sleeping around, Henry. I know, baby, I know. Don't you worry about nothing. He kissed her cheek and grabbed a pork chop from the platter before heading for the door. When you gonna be home? Late, baby. Real late. Frida parked the aging Chevy at the edge of the dirt road leading to the marsh. She sat in the driver's seat with the windows down and breathed in the sulfurous scent of plow mud and seagrass. Although the marsh teemed with life, loneliness pressed in on her like an unwelcome suitor in the dark. She walked along the water's edge toward the small house nestled in the marsh's protective embrace, unafraid in the blackness. The moon parted the dark in shifting layers as clouds crept across the Carolina sky. 
as the toe of her shoe hit the porch the front door creaked open evening big mama she said big mama stood just over six feet without shoes her husky frame held up a massive bosom and her hair fluffy and cotton white stood out against her dark skin lord frida it be midnight i knows this must be get it here the gullah accent born on the coastal waterways of the carolinas was musical as it fell from her dark unpainted lips cool marsh breeze broke through the muggy night and the thin curtains fluttered Frida sat at the rough-hewn table in the middle of what served as the cabin's kitchen and dining room, while Big Mama bustled around in cabinets, muttering under her breath. She returned to the table with two jelly jars filled with rose-colored liquid. Big Mama, I swallow that up first, child. The homemade liquid scorched her throat. She coughed, but the burning cleared her head. The swirling thoughts she brought to the cabin solidified into a concrete block of determination. She took another sip while her godmother eased into the chair opposite and lit a cheroot with a blue tip match, producing the sweet scents of tobacco and clove. What he be done now? The wicker chair creaked as Big Mama settled her bulk into it. Same old, Frida said turning the jar in her hands. The light from the fire in the nearby iron stove filtering through the glass, causing the liquid inside to shimmer. Cheating, staying out all night, and I'm tired of it. Mm-hmm. Rings of smoke dissolved in the air. I'm married. I shouldn't have to bump around in that house alone all the time that why you be married to never be long her snort forced smoke from her wide nostrils like an enraged bull got news for you child long you come this world long you leave it nothing be changing that big mama i got married because i love him i just want him to love me back he love you his own way but that ain't you won't, huh? I can't live like this. Her godmother leaned forward and placed a hand on her arm. Her scent clean and sweet, peach wine and clothing starch. You still a beautiful young woman. Go and find you someone else. Don't let that man be the daddy of you. Not like your daddy was to your mama. Tears pricked at the corner of her eyes. I don't want another man. I made a promise before God and everybody, and I will not leave Henry. Big Mama tapped ashes into a chipped china teacup. Taint worth the heartache. Better off alone. I don't ever want to be alone again. I hate it. You sure it ain't his frolicking you be missing? That's not the problem. She turned away from Big Mama's intense gaze. No shame, child. You're supposed to like bedding him. That what make him feels like a man. But it seems your man be bedding everybody else. A look of sympathy crossed the heavy woman's face and her tone became gentle. You can't change him, Frida. You marry him like that. Henry had been late for their wedding. Big Mama and Francis, her fourth husband, had found him drunk in a motel room with a street girl. Only Francis's cool head had kept Big Mama from killing Henry right then. She pulled a derringer from her bra and leveled it at the naked couple. The girl had screamed. The crusty motel sheets held to her nudity. Then she'd run for the door. As the girl passed by, Big Mama grabbed her arm and whispered something in her ear before letting her go, hollering into the sunset. 
Then she'd waited while Francis cleaned Henry up and they headed for the church. Frida and Henry were married an hour later. I know I can't change him, Frida admitted. But you can. Big Mama extinguished the cigar and drained her wine, but said nothing. Frida rushed on. You can fix it so he never strayed from me again. You can put him in a jaw or something. I've seen you root work. That's why people scared of you. Big Mama laughed. The sound of rich sing-song echo. They scared because they think root work wusser than voodoo. Taint true. They both dangerous in the right hand. The chair groaned as Big Mama leaned back and looked at the ceiling of what had once been slave quarters. But fixing the spirit to a jaw don't stop no man from catting no way. Only as one thing be doing that. The hag. That right. And the hag ain't nothing to be playing with. Not even for me. But you can do it. I can do it all right, but I ain't. Frida got up from her chair and knelt beside the woman who'd taken her in after her mother's death. Please, I don't know what else to do. You needs to just let it be, child. I can't. I need him. You ain't gonna let it be, huh? The older woman shook her head and let a sigh escape. Lord, child, that man's parts must be jumping up and dancing in you. She fingered the damp, pulpy end of the cigar. I tells you this, though. If an ascender hag ain't no telling what gonna happen. She'll take that extra energy of his and leave enough for me. That's what's supposed to happen. I just calls her. Ain't no way to control her. She do as she please. Big Mama's pause lasted several loping heartbeats before she spoke again. This ain't for you, child. Go on home. Pray on it. Set your man the way he be or leave him. I can't do that. Desperation grew in Frida's voice, making it higher pitched than usual. Why won't you do this for me? Don't you want me to be happy? Moan you know, child. Frida picked at her torn and ragged thumbnail. Do you want me to pay you? Don't be talking that foolishness. My advice always be free. There's other root workers out there. She kept her tone even and non-threatening. So your mind be made up. It wasn't a question. Yes, ma'am. Big Mama ran her hand through her puffy curls. When be your woman time? It's here now. The older woman gaped. You means to be doing this tonight? Yes, ma'am. The fire sputtered and a length of wood crumbled to ash with a swoosh. No man ever the same when she done with him. Frida nodded not trusting her voice to work around the sudden lump of fear in her throat. The two women sat on the hardwood floor of the cabin, with moonlight illuminating Big Mama's mizun plots for the ritual. Two piles of sea salt, a wad of Henry's coarse hair tied with a butcher's twine, and six blood-smeared candles sat next to the refilled juice glasses. This be your last chance, Frida. Go on, think it through. The younger woman's face remained resolute. I'm done thinking. Big Mama nodded and lit the first candle. Murky shadows danced to its flickering. When the final candle began to glow, she spoke. Go on, get me a hiding man. Frida smoothed her shirt dress and tiptoed out to the marsh, her keds squishing in the soft, dank mud. The moon was a smile in the darkness as she looked for a stalk of seagrass leaning heavily to the ground. Finding one, she crouched to complete her task, her feet sinking deeper into the cool black muck. 
she plucked a conical shell from the crisp grass and hurried back inside. Big Mama placed the open end of the shell against her neck and hummed low in her throat. The hum filled the room, vibrated across the floor to embed itself in Frida's chest, and infuse her limbs with its eerie, toneless rumble. She pulled the shell away from her throat, and Frida saw a small, pale crab, stirred by the vibration, peek out of the shell. Big Mama yanked it from its home and pulled a switchblade slick with sweat from the depths of her bosom. In one motion, she opened the knife and skewered the frightened crustacean to the floor before it could scuttle away. Henry's clump of hair covered the crab's death rose. She took a gulp of the caustic wine, spat it on the gruesome pile, and touched a candle to it. It burned, not destroying the wooden floor, while Frida's voice joined the humming. The wind came strong through the curtains, and the hovering shadows coalesced into a swirling ash-gray mass. She be here. Gets ready with that salt. The gray cloud moved around the calling space, stopping at each candle before it slunk between the two women to examine its sacrifice. Satisfied, it slid over to Frida and swayed like a cobra. She could feel its presence inside her mind, inside her chest, and she gasped as it probed at her most tender heartaches. Crushing memories rushed to the surface of her psyche. Henry's countless betrayals, looks of pity from the local women, laughter from the men. Frida's heart seized. She gasped for breath as scabs new and old tore from each emotional wound. It delved deeper in its search, picking curiously, while tears grew behind Frida's fluttering eyelids. Her chest heaved and quivered with impending sobs. The salt! Throw the salt! Big Mama yelled, breaking through the creature's trance-inducing sway. Frida's arms shook with the effort of tossing a small handful of salt over her left shoulder. While most of the salt found its way down the front of her dress, enough landed behind her to end the hag's eternal quest. The smoky funnel whirled and spun with its newfound knowledge. Brought to the surface again, her pain crystallized into diamond-hard resolve but it eased enough for her to gasp her request. Make Henry stay with me. The whirlwind roiled with fervor, covering the wine-soaked crab carcass in its dervish. When it finally moved, only the switchblade remained. The coil of ash rose in the thick, muggy air and hovered above the women. One word came from its twisting center eye. Agreed. It extinguished each candle, then dissipated to leave the women surrounded by darkness and the scent of charged sulfur. Hey, Henry. What's happening, my man? Henry's palm met his friends in an intricate succession of slaps before he sat on the next bar stool in the smoky lounge. Butch Dempsey took a sip of scotch and turned a shrewd eye on Henry. Same old, same old. Just working till I die. I hear that. What are you doing here anyway? Ain't this your anniversary night? Shit. I was wondering why Freddy was so hell-bent on having dinner with me. Shoulda known. Henry ordered a boilermaker from the bartender and rubbed a broad hand over his face. How you remember my anniversary and I don't. Cause y'all got married six years ago on Janie's birthday and I never forget Janie's birthday. Right, right. How's she doing? Janie? Oh, she got good days and bad days. Ebony circles hung under Butch's eyes stark against his pock-marked mahogany skin. Starting me more bad days. But her mama with her. Give me a few hours rest. I couldn't be sick like that. You know, live my life sick. I want to go quick. Don't want nobody giving up their life for me. 
Henry glanced at his friend. I don't mean nothing by that. What you do for Janie is good. It's... Yeah, I know. Butch drained his glass and stood. I better get on home. But he no longer had Henry's attention. Uh Uh-huh. Henry's gaze was fixed on a woman at the end of the bar. He rose from the bar stool, picked up his shot glass and the bottle of beer as though she bit him. Where'd she come from? Butch frowned at the sly smile on the strange woman's lips. A chill crept through his bulky frame and goose flesh grew on his needy arms. Don't know, but I'm gonna find out. No, I mean, she wasn't there a minute ago. Then she come through the back door. He shook off the hand Butch placed on his shoulder and straightened his collar. You disturbing my groove. You need to stay away from that one. She seems freaky. Just what I'm hoping. Catch you on the flip side, man. Henry, wait. But Henry didn't respond. He had the scent and nothing could get him off the trail. Butch watched his friend approach the mysterious woman. He started forward to intercept him and the woman looked up straight into his eyes. Her gray-blue gaze, startling against her tawny skin, held him fast. All ambient sound from the crowded bar faded. Butch felt himself grow hard, and the throbbing ached like a wound. His skin itched like it was covered in dirt. He dug his short nails into his arm with ruthless fervor. Angry welts rose up and still he raked his flesh, unable to get rid of the feeling that she was on him, in him, crawling around. He yelped when his blunt nails broke skin, the mental hold loosened and he was able to move. Without another glance at Henry, Butch pushed through the throng of people and hurried from the bar. The woman was chatting with the bartender as Henry strolled up. Hey, man, get a lady here another of what she drinking. He gave her hourglass figure a lingering once over. I'm Henry. You show us, Foxy. And you're a little cocky. Her voice was husky with no trace of southern drawl. You got me wrong, baby. He took a long pull from his beer, then pointed toward her with the bottle. I'm a big cocky. She almost choked on a sip of strawberry daiquiri, but it turned into a spurt of laughter. Now that's one I haven't heard before. What's your name? Does it matter? You'll only forget it afterwards. He leaned closer and her fragrance glided over the smokiness of the bar, a tangy mixture of sea air and citrus fruit. After what, little mama? A coy smile accompanied her words. After tonight. Now how you know what gonna happen tonight? I might decide to take my time and coat you. She shook her head and chestnut ringlets brushed her bare shoulders. It's my last night in town. You got people here? Nope. It's a business trip for me. Business? What kind of work you do? She ran her tongue over her straight, smooth teeth. I make people over. Henry nodded. That Avon kind of thing. Cool, cool. He downed his shot of whiskey. So your last night, huh? Uh Uh-huh. She looked up at him, her gray blues glittering. That's a shame. Guess I'm going to have to work fast. He slapped a tin down on the counter and stood. Not too fast, I hope. You must make some serious bread. 
This ain't no cheap motel. Henry strolled around the expansive suite, whistling at all the extra touches. Fresh flowers bloomed in the vase on the side table next to an overflowing fruit basket. A corner of the king-sized bed was turned down, revealing crisp sheets. I like to be comfortable when I travel. She tossed her clutch purse on the bedside table. This ain't just comfortable. This nice. Real nice. He stood in the middle of the room gawking until the sound of a zipper grabbed his attention. The woman stepped out of the purple satin puddle at her feet and stood, clad in only a black strapless bra and panties at the foot of the bed. Any thoughts he might be out of his league evaporated. Well, don't stop now. He unbuttoned his own shirt and tossed it on the floor as he strode over to her. She nudged him toward the bed. Why don't you lie down? and watch the rest. Oh yeah, I like that, baby. Henry lay down in the middle of the bed and watched her reach behind her back to unhook her bra. Her high breasts sprang free from their confines, and he salivated at the sight of her dark, hard nipples. She climbed into the foot of the bed and crawled up Henry's body, her eyes laughing with challenge. She straddled his waist and ground herself against his hardness as she brushed one breast over his lips. He opened his mouth and sucked on the stiffened tip. Warm liquid flowed into his mouth, and after his initial surprise, he suckled hard. He tried to reach up and pull her closer, but his body resisted, seizing up with the effort of movement. No, Henry... You don't get to touch me. Her silky voice darkened as her milk soured in his mouth. Lumpy curds drained down his cheeks. He gagged, tried to turn his head and spit, but his thick lips were fused to her slick flesh. You asked me what my name was, she said, as her fingers stroked his throat, forcing him to swallow the thick pap. Henry groaned as his stomach twisted, but it refused to expel the foul liquid. Her swollen nipple popped from his mouth when she leaned back to remove her brief panties. It's Eldra. As the silk slid down her thighs, fat drops of her vaginal fluid fell onto the crotch of her panties, bleaching the fabric a sickly yellow white. Don't ring a bell? Eldra draped the ruined underwear over Henry's face, ignoring his gurgled protests as the caustic fabric burned his skin. No one here calls me that. They call me a hag. Can you believe it? She slid down to his crotch, her bristly pubic hair like needles in his groin as her nails ripped through denim and exposed the length of him. She squatted, legs wide, her nether lips opened to expose two tiny rows of glinting silver-white teeth. His scream bubbled through the lumps in his throat as she lowered herself onto his stiffened penis. Eldris shoved her fingers into Henry's mouth, turning the panties into a putrid gag as she rode him with demonic wildness, while he lay immobile, unable to stop the flesh-rending fuck. Hours later... Elja climbed off of his limp, wasted body. She gave an impressed grunt. Oh, Henry, you're still hard. She took his mutilated penis in her palm and gripped it, holding the flayed pieces together. Her salt and citrus scent filled the room as she lowered her acidic mouth again and again. We patched him up as best we could, Miss Frida, the young nurse said as she reached for the door to the shared patient room. Frida blocked the door and whispered, How bad is it? The nurse hesitated. It's, uh, 
He's been asking for you. Frida? Is that you? Henry's voice was high-pitched and weak. Please, Frida. I need you. He sounds exhausted. That witch must have done her job. I'll be at the desk if you need anything. The nurse made a hasty exit. Frida hovered in the doorway, twisting the knob back and forth. The police had found him in an alley, the doctor had said, unconscious. He'd been beaten badly, but his clothes were still neat and pressed, as if they'd been removed and replaced later. They'd wanted to talk to her more, but she said she needed to see Henry first. She put iron in her spine and pulled the door open and strode in. Two beds were inside. The near one cradled an old man, and the other housed a hunched figure turned to face the window covered in a thin blanket. No sign of her husband. She walked toward the window until she heard a rasping behind her. I'm here, Frida. Here. Slowly, she turned to face the first bed. Her breath caught in her throat as she realized it was her husband, her Henry, small and shriveled in the middle of the bleach-white sheets. His face was a mass of blotches where the smooth, dark skin seemed to have dissolved. At the corner of his lips, white, chunky crusts formed. I need him, she'd said. Now look at him. He reached out a shaky hand to her, his flesh slack over the wasted muscle. One of his eyes was wide and pleading, the other a cloudy gray. She stepped toward the bed and pulled back the sheet covering his lower body. No, not that, too. Shriveled to nothing, the skin held together with tiny black stitches. What you gonna do now, Frida? The officers waited for her in the hall. She could see their indigo uniforms through the window. One of them looked up and met her gaze. Absently, she patted Henry's hand and beckoned the men to enter. We'd like to ask you some questions, Mr. Cannon. Are you up to talking about what happened to you? Henry turned his head into the pillow. Henry? She whispered loud enough for both men to hear. Answer them. When he didn't respond, Frida closed her eyes and her hand dropped away from her husband's shoulder. Officers, I don't think he's up to talking to anyone right now. I'm gonna get some coffee. All three of them left the room and headed toward the canteen. The taller man placed his hand at the small of her back and ushered her forward, and it sent a thrill through her where it pulled into her core. She looked up into his disarming gray-blue eyes. It's gonna be okay. Frida knew that it would. Isn't this a magnificent, horrifying knot of prejudice and entitlement, sexism and control? Wow, I've rarely seen the awful, squirming parts of the human subconscious laid out quite so beautifully and under such stark light. Let's start with Henry, because he's absolutely the villain of the piece. At first, he's a liar, he cheats, he takes his wife for granted and leaves her behind, and worst of all, he's either too much of a coward to look this in the eye, or simply doesn't care. And perhaps worse even than that, Henry is in many ways normal. And the normal Henry is, is the very worst kind of it. Small, corrupt, unaware of either, or perhaps happy with both. But he's also a man of his times, and Frida? Frida is a woman of her past, and that's where things go. 
from bad to worse. That's where things get bloody, and one of the many, many things this story does brilliantly is have the Lady Frida goes to see be the only person who can see that. What Frida has with Henry isn't sustainable. They both know that. They just care wildly different levels about it. But only Mama knows the price. Frida's nowhere near careful enough words mean there is most definitely a price. She can't see it or won't see it. Mama does. Modern needs colliding with old biases and the only thing that's left is blood and horror. Except, again, that's not quite the case. Aside from the memorably horrific description of Henry's mutilation, the final act here has two other pillars of perfect horror, both Frieda's. The first is how she shifts from victim to judge so effortlessly and how important that is to the story. Henry's mutilated, emasculated frame that she's agreed to stick with, that she's asked for. This is absolutely her fault. But all she can see is that the man she loved and hated isn't there anymore. Or rather, he is, but he's no longer pretty and easy to work with. There is no longer something to complain about. She can't claim the moral high ground. Which is, in turn, a fantastic way of sidestepping the massive, massive booby trap of ableism and turning it instead into a character note. And then there's the ending, where the power shifts and it all begins again, but somehow even worse than before. We've had a run of stories with great endings recently, and this is a proud addition to their ranks. The final lines here will stay with me for some time. Like the story that precedes them, they are subtle and horrible, symmetrical and inevitable. A trap whose beauty you admire, even as it snaps shut around you. We rely on you, and there are really two ways you can help, one of which is split into two subways. Way A and Way 2, if you will. Way A is you can go to pseudopod.org, click on Feed the Pod, and either donate or subscribe through PayPal for as little as five bucks a month. And that will gain you access to the premium content bucket, which is a veritable bucket of free audio from the company's 13 years of existence. And the other option, two, is you can go to Patreon and do the exact same thing, which gets you the exact same access. Or if you want to subscribe for a little bit higher, it gets you access to some other really, really fun tiers that we've got over there. Now, we're, we are, of course, cognizant, especially in this kind of time, that not everyone is flush enough to be able to help out financially. And the last thing we want to do is put pressure on you. So if you don't feel comfortable throwing us cash, perhaps you would consider throwing us some attention. There are all sorts of ways you could help boost our signal. And one of the easiest is just tweet about an episode you liked. Seriously, you'd be amazed the effect it has. Or, if you're a blogger, write a review of it. Even if you're not a blogger, write one on iTunes or Google, because the amount of reviews we get show, helps with our visibility, which raises everything even higher once again. Likewise, if you have a podcast yourself and you fancy having one of us on as a guest, get in touch. We love doing that kind of thing. So there are all kinds of ways that you can help us out. And if you can, if you have the time or the means, please do. And thank you. We'll be back next week when, as now, we will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. And next week, Artemis Rising 2019 begins with White Noise by Kai Hudson, hosted by the inimitable Sandra M. Odell, whose Godfall and Other Stories is an extraordinary anthology that you absolutely need, and read by Chris Tang. We'll see you then. But before we go... I want to read you this quote from Fences. Don't you try and go through life worrying about if somebody likes you or not. You best be making sure they're doing right by you. We'll see you in seven days, folks. Have fun. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days. Psst. Hey. Hey, buddy. 
You're looking for a horror podcast? Sure, you heard all the episodes of Pseudopod. But did you know they got more episodes for people that subscribe? Among the agonies of these after days is that chief of torments, inarticulateness. What I learned and saw in those hours of impious exploration can never be told for want of symbols or suggestions in any language. I say this because from first to last our discoveries partook only of the nature of sensations. Sensations correlated with no impression which the nervous system of normal humanity is capable of receiving. In fact, you remember that Challenge from Beyond episode? Well, they've been featuring stories by every single author that was involved in that thing. All things end, both good and bad. Such a life as I had lived was unbearable. Ortali had dangled the gallows before my eyes until it had lost its terrors. I had staggered beneath the load I carried because of my love for my work. But all human endurance has its limits. My hands turned to iron as I thought of Ortali, working beside me at midnight at the lonely cairn. One stroke, with such a stone as I had caught up that day, and my agony would be ended. That life and hopes and career and ambition would be ended as well could not be helped. Plus, uh, all other kind of goodies... Like a century harbor? I'm passing through unearthly angles. I'm approaching. Oh, the burning horror of it. Chalmers, I cried. Do you wish me to interfere? He brought his right hand quickly before his face, as though to shut out a vision unspeakable. Not yet, he cried. I will go on. I will see what lies beyond. A cold sweat streamed from his forehead, and his shoulders jerked spasmodically. Beyond life there are... His face grew ashen with terror. Things that I cannot distinguish. They move slowly, through angles. They have no bodies, and they move slowly through outrageous angles. And, uh, lots more to come. So, keep it under your hat. Go to Feed the Pod. Subscribe. And you'll have access to ton of cool stuff. I never heard of nothing like this, and here he pointed to a fabulous creature of the artist, which one might describe as a sort of dragon with the head of an alligator. But now I'll show you the best in over here, near the middle. The old man's speech grew a trifle thicker, and his eyes assumed a brighter glow. But his fumbling hands, though seemingly clumsier than before, were entirely adequate to their mission. The book fell open, almost of its own accord, and as if from frequent consultation at this place, to the repellent twelfth plate, showing a butcher's shop amongst the antique cannibals. Don't tell anybody I told you.